Welcome to episode 120 of Myths, Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Mylan de and today we hear how a child named Minikin conquers three trolls to save two captured princesses in Minikin. There was once upon a time a couple of needy folk who lived in a wretched hut in which there was nothing but black want. So they had neither food to eat nor wood to burn. But if they had had next to nothing of all else, they had the blessing of God so far as children were concerned, and every year brought them one more. The man was not overpleased at this. He was always going about grumbling and growling and saying that it seemed to him that there might be such a thing as having too many of these good gifts. So shortly before another baby was born, he went away into the wood for some firewood, saying that he did not want to see the new child. He would hear him quite soon enough when he began to squall for some food. As soon as this baby was born, he began to look around the room. Ah, my dear mother, said he, give me some of my brother's old clothes and food enough for a few days, and I will go out into the world and seek my fortune, for so far as I can see you have children enough. Heaven help you, my son, said the mother. That will never do. You are still too little. But the little creature was determined to do it, and begged and prayed so long that the mother was forced to let him have some old rags and tie up a little food for him, and then gaily and happily he went out into the world. But almost before he was out of the house, another boy was born, and he too looked about him and said, Oh, my dear mother, give me some of my brother's old clothes and food for for some days, and then I will go out into the world and find my twin brother, for you have children enough. Heaven help you, little creature. You are far too little for that, said the woman. It would never do. But she spoke to no purpose, for the boy begged and prayed until he had gotten some old rags and a bundle of provisions, and then he set out manfully into the world to find his twin brother. When the younger had walked for some time, he caught sight of his brother a short distance in front of him, and he called to him and bade him to stop. Wait, he said, you are walking as if uh, for a wager, but you ought to have stayed to see your younger brother before you hurried off into the world. So the elder stood still and looked back. When the younger brother had got up to him and had told him that he was his brother, he said, but now let us sit down and see what kind of food our mother has given us. And that they did. When they had walked on a little farther, they came to a brook which ran through a green meadow. And there the younger said they ought to christen each other. As they had made such a haste and had no time to do it at home, we may as well do it here, said he. What will you be called? asked the elder. I will be called Minikin, answered the second. And what will you be called? I will be called King Pippin, answered the elder. They christened each other and then went onwards. When they had walked for some time, they came to a crossway, and there they agreed to part and each take his own road. This they did. But no sooner had they walked a short distance than they met again. So they parted once more, and each took his own road. But in a very short time, the same thing happened again, before they were at all aware. And so it happened the third time also. Then they arranged with each other that each should choose his own quarter, and one should go east and the other west. But if you ever fall into any need or trouble, said the elder, Call me thrice, and I will come and help you, only you must not call me until you are in the utmost need. In that case, we shall not see each other for some time, said Minikin. So they bade farewell to each other, and Minikin went east, and King Pippin went west. When Minikin had walked a long way alone, he met an old, old, crooked-backed hag, who had only one eye. Minikin stole it. Oh, oh, 
cried the old hag. What has become of my eye? What will you give me to get your eye back? said Finnegan. I will give you a sword, which is such a sword that it can conquer a whole army. Let it be ever so great, replied the woman. Let me have it then, said Minikin. The old hag gave him the sword, so she got her eye back. Then Minikin went onwards, and when he had wandered on for some time, he met an old, old, crooked back hag, who had only one eye. Minikin stole it before she was aware. Oh, oh, what has become of my eye? cried the old hag. What will you give me to get your eye back? said Minikin. I will give you a ship which can sail over fresh water and salt water, over high hills and deep dales, answered the old woman. Let me have it then, said Minikin. So the old woman gave him a little bit of a ship, which was no bigger than he could put in his pocket. And then she got her eye back, and she went on her way. And Minikin went on his way. When he had walked on for a long time, he met the third time an old, old, crooked-backed hag who had only one eye. This eye also Minikin stole. And when the woman screamed and lamented and asked what had become of her eye, Minikin said, Well, what will you give me to get your eye back? I will give you the art to brew a hundred lasts of malt in one brewing. So for teaching that art, the old hag got her eye back, and they both went away by different roads. But when Minikin had walked a short distance, it seemed to him that he might be worth while to see what his ship could do. So he took it out of his pocket, and first he put one foot into it, and then the other. And no sooner had he put one foot into the ship than it became much larger. And when he set the other foot into it, it grew as large as ships that sail on the sea. Then Minikin said, Now go over fresh water and salt water, over high hills and deep dales, and do not stop until you come to the king's palace. And in an instant, the ship went away as swiftly as any bird in the air till it got just below the king's palace, and there it stood still. From the windows of the king's palace, many persons had seen Minikin come sailing thither, and had stood to watch him, and they were all so astounded that they ran down to see what manner of man this could be who came sailing in a ship through the air. But while they were running down from the king's palace, Minikin had got out of the ship and put it in his pocket again. For the moment he got out of it, it once more became as small as it had been when he got it from the old woman, and those who came from the king's palace could see nothing but a ragged little boy who was standing down by the seashore. The king asked where he had come from, but the boy said he did not know, nor yet could he tell them how he had got there. But he begged very earnestly and prettily for a place in the king's palace. If there was nothing else for him to do, he said, he would fetch wood and water for the kitchen maid, and that he obtained leave to do. When Minikin went up to the king's palace, he saw that everything there was hung with black, both outside and inside, from the bottom to the top. So he asked the kitchen maid what that meant. Oh, I'll tell you that, answered the kitchen maid. The king's daughter was long ago promised away to three trolls. And next Thursday evening, one of them is to come to fetch her. Ritter Red has said that he will be able to set her free, but who knows whether he will be able to do it. So you may easily imagine what grief and distress we are in here. So when Thursday evening came, Ritter Red accompanied the princess to the seashore, for there she was to meet the troll, and Ritter Red was to stay with her and protect her. He however, was very unlikely to do that. He, however, was very likely to do the troll much injury, for no sooner had the princess seated herself by the seashore than Ritter Red climbed up into a great tree which was standing there and hid himself as well as he could among the branches. The princess wept 
and begged him most earnestly not to go and leave her. But Ritter Red did not concern himself about that. <laughs> it is better that one should die than two, said he. In the meantime, Minikin begged the kitchen maid very prettily to give him leave to go down to the strand for a short while. Oh, what could you be doing at the strand, said the kitchen maid. You have nothing to do there. Oh, yes, my dear, just let me go, said Minikin. I should so like to go and amuse myself with the other children. Well, well, go then, said the kitchen maid. But don't let me find you stay in there over the time when the pan has to be set on the fire for supper and the roast put on the spit. And mind you bring back a good big armful of wood for the kitchen. Minikin promised this and ran down to the seashore. Just as he got to the place where the king's daughter was sitting, the troll came rushing up with a great whistling and whirring, and he was so big and stout that he was terrible to see, and he had five heads. Fire! screeched the troll. Fire yourself, said Minikin. Can you fight? roared the troll. <laughs> if not, I can learn, said Minikin. So the troll struck at him with a great, thick iron bar, which he had in his fist, till the sods flew five yards up into the air. Fie, said Minikin, that was not much of a blow. Now you can see one of mine. So he grasped the sword which he had got from the old crooked back woman, and slashed at the troll so that all five heads went flying away over the sands. When the princess saw that she was delivered, she was so delighted that she did not know what she was doing and skipped and danced. Come and sleep a bit with your head in my lap, said she to Minikin. And as he slept, she put a golden dress on him. But when Ritter Red saw that there was no longer any danger afoot, he lost no time in creeping down from the tree. He then threatened the princess until at length she was forced to promise to say that it was he who had rescued her, for he told her that she did not. He would kill her. Then he took the troll's lungs and tongue and put them in his pocket handkerchief and led the princess back to the king's palace, and whatsoever had been lacking to him in the way of honor before was lacking no longer. For the king did not know how to exalt him enough, and always set him on his right hand at the table. As for Minikin, first he went out on the troll's ship and took a great quantity of gold and silver hoops away with him, and then he trotted back to the king's palace. When the kitchen maid caught sight of all this gold and silver, she was quite amazed and said, my dear friend, Minikin, where have you got all that from? For she was half afraid that he had not come by it honestly. Oh, asked Minikin. Oh, I have been home a while, and these hoops had fallen off some of your buckets, so I brought them away with me for you. So when the kitchen maid heard that they were for her, she asked no more questions about the matter. She thanked Minikin, and everything was right again at once. Next Thursday evening, all went just the same, and every one was full of grief and affliction. But Ritter Red said that he had been able to deliver the king's daughter from one troll so that he could very easily deliver her from another, and he led her down to the seashore. But he did not do much harm to this troll either, for when the time came when the troll might be expected, he said it was as it was before. It is better that I should climb and die than two, and then climbed up into the tree again. Minikin once more begged the cook's leave to go down to the seashore for a short time. Oh, what can you do there? said the cook. My dear, let me go, said Minikin. I should so like to go down there and amuse myself a little with the other children. So this time also she said that he should have leave to go, but he must first promise that he would be back by the time the joint was turned and that he would bring a great armful of wood with him. 
No sooner had Minikin got down to the strand than the troll came rushing along with a great whistling and whirring, and he was twice as big as the first troll, and he had ten heads. Fire! shrieked the troll. Fire yourself, said Minikin. Can you fight? roared the troll. If not, I can learn, said Minikin. So the troll struck at him with his iron club, which was still bigger than that which the first troll had had, so that the earth flew ten yards up into the air. Fie, said Minikin. That was not much of a blow. Now you shall see one of my blows. Then he grasped his sword and struck at the troll so that all his ten heads danced away over the sands. And again, the king's daughter said to him, Sleep a while on my lap. And while Minikin lay there, she drew some silver raiment over him. As soon as Ritter Red saw that there was no longer any danger afoot, he crept down from the tree and threatened the princess until at last she was again forced to promise to say that it was he who rescued her. After which he took the tongue and the lungs of the troll and put them into his pocket handkerchief, and then he conducted the princess back to the palace. There was joy and gladness in the palace, as may be imagined, and the king did not know how to show enough honor and respect. however, took home with him an armful of gold and silver hoops from the troll's ship. When he came back to the king's palace, the kitchen maid clapped her hands and wondered where he could have gotten all that gold and silver. But Minikin answered that he had been home for a short time and that it was only the hoops which had fallen off some pails and that he had brought them away for the kitchen maid. When the third Thursday evening came, everything happened exactly as it had happened on the two former occasions. Everything in the king's palace was hung with black, and everyone was sorrowful and distressed. But Ritter Red said that he did not think that there was much reason to be afraid. He had delivered the king's daughter from two trolls, so he could easily deliver her from the third as well. He led her down to the strand, but when the time drew near for the troll to come, he climbed up into the tree again and hid himself. The princess wept and entreated him to stay, but all to no purpose. He struck to his old speech. It is better that one life should be lost than two. This evening also, Minikin begged for leave to go down to the seashore. Oh, what can you do there? answered the kitchen maid. However, he begged until at last he got leave to go. But he was forced to promise that he would be back again in the kitchen when the roast had to be turned. Almost immediately after he had gotten down to the seashore, the troll came with a great buzzing and whirring, and he was much, much bigger than either of the two former ones, and he had fifteen heads. Fie! roared the troll. Fie yourself, said Minikin. Can you fight? screamed the troll. If not, I can learn, said Minikin. I will teach you, yelled the troll, and struck at him with his iron club so that the earth flew up fifteen yards high into the air. Fie, said Minikin. That was not much of a blow. Now I will let you see one of my blows. So saying, he grasped his sword and cut at the troll in such a way that all fifteen heads danced away over the sands. Then the princess was delivered, and she thanked Minikin and blessed him for saving her. Sleep a while on my lap, she said. While he lay there, she put a garment of brass upon him. But now, how shall we make it known that it was you who saved me, said the king's daughter. That I will tell you, answered Minikin. When Ritter Red has taken you home again and given out that it was he who rescued you, he will, as you know, have you to wife and half the kingdom. 
But when they ask you on your wedding day whom you will have to be your cupbearer, you must say, I will have the ragged boy who is in the kitchen and carries wood and water for the kitchen maid. And when I am filling your cups for you, I will spill a drop upon his plate, but not upon yours. And then he will be angry and strike me. And this will take place thrice. But the third time you must say, Shame on you thus to smite the beloved of mine heart. It is he who delivered me from the troll, and he is the one whom I will have. Then Minikin ran back to the king's palace as he had done before. But first he went on board the troll's ship and took a great quantity of gold and silver and other precious things. And out of these he once more gave to the kitchen maid a whole armful of gold and silver hoops. No sooner did Ritter Red see that all danger was over than he crept down from the tree and threatened the king's daughter till he made her promise to say that he had rescued her. Then he conducted her back to the king's palace, and if honor enough had not been done for him before, it was certainly done now, for the king had no other thought than how to make much of a man who had saved his daughter from the three trolls, and it was settled. Then, that the Ritter Red should marry her and receive half the kingdom. On the wedding day, however, the princess begged that she might have the little boy who was in the kitchen and carried wood and water for the kitchen maid to fill the wine cups at the wedding feast. Oh, what would you want that dirty, ragged boy in here? said Ritter Red. But the princess said that she insisted on having him as cupbearer and would have no one else. And at last she got leave, and then everything was done as had been agreed on between the princess and Minikin. He spilt a drop on Ritter Red's plate, but none upon hers. And each time that he did it, Ritter Red fell into a rage and struck him. At the first blow, all the ragged garments which he had worn in the kitchen fell from off Minikin. At the second blow, the brass garments fell off and at the third the silver raiment, and there he stood in the golden raiment, which was so bright and splendid that light flashed from it. Then the king's daughter said, Shame on you thus to smite the beloved of my heart. It is he who delivered me from the troll, and it is he whom I will have. Ritter Red swore that he was the man who had saved her. But the king said, He who delivered my daughter must have some token in proof of it. So Ritter Red ran off at once for his handkerchief with the lungs and tongue, and Minikin went and brought all the gold and silver and precious things which he had taken out of the troll ships, and they each of them laid these tokens before the king. He who has such precious things and gold and silver and diamonds said the king, must be the one who killed the troll, for such things are not to be had anywhere else. So Ritter Red was thrown into the snake pit, and Minikin was to have the princess and half the kingdom. One day the king went out walking with Minikin, and Minikin asked him if he had never had any other children. Yes, said the king, I had another daughter, but the troll carried her away because there was no one who could deliver her. You're going to have one daughter of mine, but if you could set the other who has been taken by the troll, you shall willingly have her too, and the other half of my kingdom as well. I may as well make the attempt, said Minikin, but I must have an iron rope, which is five hundred ells long, and then I must have five hundred men with me, and provisions for five weeks, for I have a long voyage before me. So the king said he should have these things, but the king was afraid that he had no ship large enough to carry them all. But I have a ship of my own, said Minikin, and he took the one which the old woman had given him out of his pocket. <laughs> the king laughed at him and thought it was only one of his jokes, but Minikin begged him just to give him what he asked for, and then he should see something. Then all that Minikin had asked for was brought, and first he ordered them to lay the cable in the ship. But 
there was no one who was able to lift it and there was only one room for one or two men at a time in that little bit of a ship. Then Minikin himself took hold of the cable and laid one or two links of it into the ship. And as he threw the links into the ship, it grew bigger and bigger. And at last it was so large that the cable and the 500 men and provisions and Minikin himself had room enough. Now go over fresh water and salt water, over hill and dale, and do not stop until you come to where the king's daughter is, said Minikin to the ship. And off it went into a moment over land and water, till the wind whistled and moaned all around about it. When they had sailed thus long, long way, the ship stopped short in the middle of the sea. Ah, oh, now we have got there, said Minikin. But how we are going to get back again is a very different thing. Then he took the cable and tied one end of it around his body. Now I must go to the bottom, he said. But when I give a good jerk to the cable and want to come back up again, you must all pull like one man, or there will be an end of all life, both for you and for me. So saying, he sprang into the water, and yellow bubbles rose up around him. He sank lower and lower. At last he came to the bottom. There he saw a large hill with a door in it, and he went in. When he got inside, he found the other princess sitting sewing. But when she saw Minikin, she clapped her hands. Oh, heaven be praised, she cried. I have not seen a human man since I came here. I have come for you, said Minikin. Alas, you will not be able to get me, said the king's daughter. It is no use even to think of that. If the troll catches sight of you, he will take your life. You better tell me about him, said Minikin. Where is he gone? It would be amusing to see him. So the king's daughter told Minikin that the troll was out trying to get hold of someone who could brew a hundred lasts of malt at one brewing, where there was to be a feast at the trolls, which less than that would not be drunk. I can do that, said Minikin. Ah, oh, if only the troll were not so quick-tempered, I might have told him that, answered the princess. But he is so ill-natured that he will tear you to pieces. I fear as soon as he comes in, but I will try to find some way of doing it. Can you hide yourself here in the cupboard? And then we will see what happens. Minikin did this, and almost before he had crept into the cupboard and hidden himself came the troll. Mm. What a smell of human man's blood, said the troll. Yes, a bird flew over the roof with a human man's bones in his bill and let it fall into our chimney, answered the princess. I made haste enough to get it away again, but it must be that which smells so notwithstanding. Yes, it must be that, said the troll. Then the princess asked if he had got hold of anyone who could brew a hundred last of malt at one brewing. No. There is no one who can do it, said the troll. A short time since, there was a man here who said he could do it, said the king's daughter. How clever you always are, said the troll. How could you let him go away? You must have known that I was just wanting a man of that kind. Well, but I didn't let him go after all, said the princess. But father is so quick-tempered, so I hid him in the cupboard. But if father has not found anyone, then the man is still here. Let him come in, said the troll. When Minikin came, the troll asked if it were true that he could brew a hundred last of malt at one brewing. Yes, said Minikin, it is. It is well, then, I have lighted on you, said the troll. Fall to work this very minute, but heaven help me, if you do not brew the ale strong. Oh, it shall taste well, said Minikin, and at once set himself to work to brew. But... I must have more trolls to help to carry what is wanted, said Minikin. These that I have are good for nothing. So he got more, and so many that there was a swarm of them. And then the brewing went on. When the sweet wort was ready, they were all, as a matter of course, anxious to taste it. First the troll himself, then the others. But Minikin had brewed the wort so strong that they all 
fell down dead like so many flies as soon as they had drunk any of it. At last, there was no one left but one wretched old hag who was lying behind the stove. <laughs> oh, poor old creature, said Minikin. You shall have a taste of the wort too like the rest. So he went away and scooped up a little from the bottom of the brewing vat in a milk pan and gave it to her. And then he was quit of the whole of them. While Minikin was now standing there looking about, he cast his eyes on a large chest. This he took and filled with gold and silver, and then he tied the cable around himself and the princess and the chest and tugged at the rope with all his might, whereupon his men drew them up safe and sound. As soon as Minikin had gotten safely on the ship again, he said, now we go over salt water and fresh water over hill and dale and do not stop until you come upon the king's palace and in a moment the ship went off so fast that the yellow foam rose up round about it when those who were in the king's palace saw the ship they lost no time in going to meet him with song and music and thus they marched up towards minikin with great rejoicing but the gladdest of all was the king, for now he got his other daughter back again. But now Minikin was not happy, for both the princesses wanted to have him, and he wanted to have none other than the one whom he had first saved, and she was the younger. For this cause he was continually walking backwards and forwards, thinking how he could contrive to get her, and yet do nothing that was unkind to her sister. One day, when he was walking about and thinking of this, it came upon his mind that if he only had his brother, King Pippin, with him, who was so like himself that no one could distinguish the one from the other, he could let him have the elder princess and half the kingdom. As for himself, he thought the other half was quite enough. As soon as this thought occurred to him, he went outside the palace and called for King Pippin. But no one came, so he called a second time, and a little louder. But still, no one came. So Minikin called for the third time, and with all his might, and there stood his brother by his side. I told you that you were not to call me unless you were in the utmost need, he said to Minikin. And there is not even so much as a midge here who can do any harm. And with that, he gave Minikin such a blow that he rolled over on the grass. Shame on you to strike me, said Minikin. First, have I won one princess and half the kingdom, and then the other princess and the other half of the kingdom, and now, when I was just thinking that I would give you one of the princesses and one of the halves of the kingdom, do you think you have any reason to give me such a blow? When King Pippin heard that he begged his brother's pardon, and they were reconciled, and at once became good friends. Now, as you know, said Minikin, we are so like each other that no one can tell one from the other. So, just change clothes with me and go up to the palace, and then the princess will think that I am coming in, and the one who kisses you first shall be yours, and I will have the other for he knew that the elder princess was the stronger, so he could very well guess how things would go. King Pippin at once agreed to this. He changed clothes with his brother and went into the palace. When he entered the princess's apartment, they believed that he was Minikin, and both of them ran up to him at once. But the elder, who was bigger and stronger, pushed her sister aside and threw her arms around King Pippin's neck and kissed him, so he got her to wife. And Minikin, the younger sister, it will be easy to understand that two weddings took place, and they were so magnificent that they were heard of and talked about over seven kingdoms. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.